as brothers and sisters in service to love, we all have different understandings of God. For me, I'm a Catholic Christian who was a nursing monk for a number of years and over a period of time I became dis disillusioned with my own church and I guess that was the Spirit of God trying to prepare me for a new event in my life something I knew nothing about but in 2008 something happened and it was it was a profound experience church bells didn't ring the ground didn't open up but kneeling before the tomb of Francis of Assisi in Assisi I just became aware of this amazing man who replicated the life of the Christ Jesus the barefoot Galilean and who wasn't a man of many letters he was simple although he came from a, a well-connected family in Assisi but he left a legacy from the 12th century this man this simple humble man has left a legacy for the world a blueprint a blueprint that invites you to awaken to love. I've read many books on the life of this incredible man, but one that has touched my heart the most is one that was given to me as a gift. Yes, we had um, our carpets cleaned here a few months ago, because when you have three dogs and lots of people coming and going to our little monastery, you get lots of dog hairs lying around so they said to me had I read a particular book called Francis Life and Lessons by a local man from Lancaster called Chris Park and I said no I'd never heard of it so when they came to do the carpets two weeks later they brought me this beautiful book and this is the book Francis life and lessons and it is it's not flowery it's from the heart and it says on the back page which I shall read to you if I may Francis of Assisi one of the most popular saints and the patron saint of ecology is an enigma well that's true he was born into a wealthy family but gave it all up when he felt called by God to live a life of extreme poverty he dreamed of becoming a knight but ended up preaching peace and reconciliation he sought spiritual solitude but found himself head of a large religious order he was a radical but remained loyal to his church the Catholic Church his life and works hold many lessons for us today as we seek ways of living that are informed by the Gospels and rooted in integrity and that's the summary on the back of this book but allow me to just invite you now to just be still for a moment to be still in the presence of God the creator of life and love Let us come into that presence and let us invite the Spirit of God, the fire of God, to communicate with our heart so that we can understand 
the life of Francis of Assisi because he is an enigma. But interestingly, Lord Kutumi, an ascended master, ascend, uh, incarnated as Francis of Assisi. And Francis of Assisi is a man of peace. And surely in today's world, we need men of peace. But I take heart because in every generation the Father, Mother, God Supreme raises up a child of God to reawaken within the hearts of mankind their need for God, their need for simplicity and truth, their need to come back to their heart. And in today's climate, we need such men and women. And in truth, there are such men and women of different faiths and none that God has chosen to speak with us. How do I know that? Well, let's look at Martin Luther King another good man, Sri Chimoy, another good man of peace. He did not set up a clique like Francis. He didn't set up an elitist group that would ostracize other people. He embraced all, as did Mother Teresa of Calcutta, a friend of God. Gandhi, our dear brother Gandhi, the late Pope John Paul II from Poland, another great man. And in this lifetime we have His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, a man of peace. So what do they all have in common with Francis of Assisi? They are men and women of peace. So we begin this incredible journey over the next several Mondays where we look at the life of this 12th century mystic, a simple man who has much to say. But to understand the man, it's good to have a little bit of background to him, to understand where he came from because a lot of non-believers who've switched off to religion, understandably so. When you mention Francis of Assisi, they go, yeah, the man with the birds and the animals. You see, they know of him. They may not know a lot about him. So the purpose of doing these webinars or live streams is to try and reawaken within myself things that I may have missed in reading this book which I'm still reading and to allow me understand a man I love who is not God but who is from God and to see is there anything that I could incorporate in my day-to-day -day living as an enclosed contemplative Franciscan who was guided by this man, Francis, to reach out to all faiths and none. And not to talk about God, not to talk the walk, but to walk the talk. In other words, to practice what we preach by sharing Franciscan hospitality, which is love. And I'm proud to be a member of the Teo community of interfaith Franciscans. For we live a simple life. We are detached from the world and attached to God. And we each follow our own rule of life, whether we're Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh or Baha'i. 
but we're in service to one master, God. So we begin. <clears throat> we read the introduction, and the introduction is quite interesting. Let me share. They gathered in their thousands and from many different countries. They were all men and they were monk. They wore monk's tunics in a variety of shades of black, brown and white, but there was no one there in denim. <laughs> they were quite a sight, a huge mass of men of all shapes and sizes tall and short, fat and thin, bearded and bald. They spoke many different languages, often very animately. Some talked loudly into their mobile phones, hands gesticulating uncontrollably, while some sent texts and emails on their blackberries. Some simply stood and gazed at the sea of kindred spirits all around them. Some smoked serenely in the midday sun. Many looked like a cameo monk awaiting their entry into some great movie being filmed. Some walked with a pronounced swagger, enjoying not only the occasion but the public spectacle of it all for a religious order founded on poverty and simplicity. There were some expensive haircuts, watches, digital cameras, mobile phones and briefcases on display. I wonder what Francis would have said. The men had traveled from all parts of the world as pilgrims, visiting the mother church of the Franciscan religious order and movement to walk in the footsteps of their founder and inspiration, Francis, Francesco Bernadone, better known in his day as simply Francis, and know around the world since his death as St. Francis of Assisi. It was Easter 2009 in Assisi in Italy. This was a chapter meeting, the Franciscan, uh, the Franciscan equivalent of a gathering of the clans, which now takes place in Assisi every 10 years. And when representatives of the Franciscan order in different countries meet to pray, study, and make decisions. This particular gathering was very special because it marked the 800th anniversary of the founding of the Franciscan Order. Apart from being a rather theatrical site, what is the relevance of this gathering to ordinary people today? More than eight centuries after the death of the man who established their religious order. Does Francis have anything meaningful to say to us? Or is he simply a voice from the past, albeit a very well-known one? Francis and the order he established were very much products of their time and place. The time was 13th century Europe, a period which, as G.K. Chesterton, one of France's biographers, points out, witnessed a fresh flowering of culture and the creative arts after a long spell of much sterner and even more sterile experience, which we call the Dark Ages. Sweeping reforms of church discipline were underway which included the new obligation of celibacy for priests and new constraints on financial corruption by the clergy, for example through the sale of indulgences or pardons 
and the Crusades were in full swing in the Holy Land against the Muslims. Feudalism had declined and had been replaced by capitalism. And a new merchant class was emerging. Donald Spoto, another of France's biographers, adds that there was also an astonishing leap forward in what might be called the life of the mind and the spirit. The long and successful efforts of the Irish monks to keep literature alive contributed greatly to the formation of new intellectual synthesis, first in monastic schools and then in the great universities of Bologna, Padua, Paris and Oxford. The late 12th century was also a time of experimentation in religious life. As many monks abandoned their monasteries to live individually as hermits or in smaller isolated communities that rejected the wealth, land and feudal privileges accumulated by their abbots. Simultaneously, the rise of lay poverty movements and independent preachers summoned people to penance and a reformed life led to serious consideration of precisely how one could live the Christian faith in the midst of a swiftly changing and suffering society. This is the world that Francis was born into. The place was Assisi, a typical medieval hilltop. It was a town in Umbria, central Italy, about 10 miles southeast of Perugia and 90 miles south east of Florence. The landscape of Umbria is littered with such hilltop towns, with buildings huddled together partly through lack of space, but also for defensive purposes, more for defense against attacks by neighboring towns than defense against the weather. These towns have narrow streets, steep hills and open squares or piazzas, which is sky with a skyline typically dominated by grand churches, and tall stone domestic towers built for family security, but also as conspicuous displays of wealth and status. Assisi is built on a spur on the western side of Mount Sebastio, which shelters it from harsh winds. Through most of its history it was surrounded by woodland and fields. The town pours down gently into the groves of olive trees that blanket her feet, leading to the verdant Spoleto Valley below. Above the city, the Rocca Maggiore fortress keeps a watchful eye on the city of Perugia, its former nemesis 16 miles across the open plain. Assisi was an important Roman city and still has remains of Roman walls and of a former temple of Minerva which was converted into a Christian church in the 16th century. Excuse me. It was famous for its natural springs as far back as Roman times. It is one of the oldest towns in Italy and had been conquered in 1160 by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa who ruled the areas we now call Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, well half of it, the Netherlands and Italy, except for the Papal States. The town of Assisi has attracted many countless visitors.
and today it attracts many pilgrims from all over the world who come to see, to experience the Francis experience. They want to see where Francis was born. They want to connect with his roots so that when they, like me, read his story, they want to be able to say, I was there. And I was there in 2008. But I didn't fully understand till I started to read this little book, Francis, Life and Lessons, because it takes you into the intimate journey of his family. An amazing little book. They, came, they come alone and in groups and they include people of all faiths and none. Shortly before he died, Francis had prayed a blessing over the city saying, God bless you. God bless you, holy city. A blessing over the city saying, again and again, God bless you, holy city. For through you many souls will be saved and within you many servants of God will dwell, and from you many will be chosen for the realms of life eternal. Isn't that beautiful? Assisi was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in the year 2000 because of its architecture, its artistic and spiritual heritage and impact its preservation of buildings and landscapes and as the birthplace of the Franciscan order and movement. On the 26th of September 1997, the town and surrounding area were struck by an earthquake which damaged the Basilica of St. Francis and other buildings, but most of the damage has since been repaired. It was tragic to watch the news and to see the most magnificent frescoes. And I've seen them. Some of them are fading now, but they are exquisite. And you can see where the cracks came and you could put your hand through. It was, it was maybe a message from God. We don't know. But I always say these things happen for a reason. <clears throat> now the sources. Whilst Francis lived many centuries ago, we know a great deal about him. Indeed, as Robinson, as Robinson points out, there are few, if any, medieval lives more thoroughly documented. According to the bibliography of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., more biographers have been written biographies have been written about Francis than about any other person. A search for Francis of Assisi in the integrated catalogue of the British Library shows 435 entries and a search for Francis Assisi in Google produces nearly 2 million results. Wow. Inevitably, most of this vast range of material about Francis relies heavily excuse me, on the early sources which have survived the early centuries. This early source material falls into two categories. First, there are Francis' own writings, which Franciscan priest and writer Murray Bodo whom we met here, points out are personal, simple and direct. They include his directions to the order he founded, including the rule, the admonitions and his will. The rule for the poor Clares and some letters to Clare and one to Brother Leo. Secondly, there are two early biographies written by contemporaries who knew, who knew Francis. The first biography 
was the life of Francis written in 1228 by Thomas of Silano, who joined the Franciscan order 11 years before Francis died and knew him personally. Silano's biography was written in 1247 as, as the second life to correct some questionable passages about Brother Elias. Solano insists that it would take too long and indeed it would be impossible to recount everything Francis did and to summarize all he taught in his lifetime. But that did not stop him from writing with gushing enthusiasm as one might expect from a writer whose main objective is to elevate his subject to the highest level of perfection. Stay, stays cautions us to remember that Silano tells the truth as he sees it. The truth seen through the eyes of the 13th century religious whose subject was his hero and his idol. Celano's writing sit firmly in the category of hagiography, writing that deliberately idealizes a person rather than a biography, so we must treat his text with appropriate care and sensitivity. And there we're going to leave it, because we've read from eight o'clock, and I feel that sometimes when someone is reading to you it can get a little bit heavy and probably a bit boring and I'm not wanting to undermine the wonderful work of Francis of Assisi because he touches my life in such a profound way I have a great love for Francis and I pray that many will become inspired by this man's great work he, he touches hearts, but when he does touch your heart, he really does speak to your heart. I want you to be still with me now as we just celebrate the life of this good man, the life of Francis of Assisi. And I would like to conclude by playing Tom Kenyon as he sings the prayer of Francis of Assisi. And thank you for joining me. Good night and God bless you. Thank uh -huh.